Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Voodoo Room. Today's guest is the very charismatic Dave Bowers, i.e. Eugene Hamilton. Stand by, because here we come in the Voodoo Room. I went for a job uh, mm. to do uh, packing at Coles, and I didn't. Even, and with all my credentials and stuff, mm. couldn't even get that. Just recently. Just recently. Yeah, right. Couldn't get a look in. You know, so it makes you wonder, you know. It, it does just sort of sting everyone in the arts to know that the current government just doesn't really think you're worth anything. Well, I don't know if it's a government thing. I think it's a business thing. I think it's uh, I think it's a bit of both. I think uh, the business people make the decisions. The HR department in, in those type of industries make the decisions, don't they? Because they look at the... Yeah, but uh, I'm talking to, specifically about the bailout packages that oh, yeah, industries more, yeah. did and didn't get. I'm not talking about Coles yeah. Yeah. hiring you as a shelf stacker. Yeah. Or not. That's um, a different issue. Yeah, but. you're talking the greater looking after. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And I agree with you there 100% because we've been left on a limb basically mm. you know we we we're, we're the covert we we are the mm. covert um element of the covert mm. if you know what i mean because i think what we generally are looked upon is politicians do go out and watch music and they mm. and some of them have been big fans of music you know mm. um going back to whitlam era you know even mm. before that you know whether it's been classical music uh contemporary music yeah. pop music <clears throat> And then, and then, but when it comes to bat for the arts, I mean, I think Paul Keating was the only one who really went in batting for the arts mm. in my time, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, just to, and I'm not just talking about myself individually or just people yeah. who play in bands or yeah. whatever. It's it's the whole arts. That's right. Everyone who works in the arts, including the classical musicians right. who play for the MSO and all sorts of people, opera singers, mm. and who were suddenly told from the top, you don't count. Mm. It's interesting to... You know, we're not going to die. We're going to survive. We're not, you know, but it's interesting to sort of feel that your government doesn't really want to represent you at all. To be on that side of that kind of thing, we get a, maybe a tiny inkling of what it feels like to mm. be um, truly under unrepresented. And Because I yeah. heard the German uh, par- parliament has uh, given all artists doesn't matter what side of art you come from as long as you qualify as an artist mm. they give you nine thousand dollars up front to survive on yeah oh, well that's good i mean yeah. everyone's got a tax history the, the ato's got your tax <laughs> yeah, return right. you they know what you've earned and that's they know right. what you put yourself down as a musician mm. that's you know, right they know that it's not like you can suddenly everyone can just knock on their door and say oh i'm a musician too yeah here's my nine thousand bucks that's know. right that's it's, right or you're a painter like which you are yeah you, you, you are a painter and uh, painters get looked after in Germany as much as what a musician would mm. get. Look, you still get that $9,000 because I know a, an artist from Germany who's been stranded up in Byron Bay who were touring here in mm. uh, January and yeah. they were meant to fly out in February but because of all the COVID stuff, mm. they're stranded up in um, the Blue Mountains, sorry. Yeah. And they can't get back to Germany but they've been in the bank account, they were broke and the, the government put $9,000 into their account and it was just like and, – and also they've seized uh, all rent. Mm. So if you're right. a renter, apparently you don't have to pay rent for five years. And the other thing is that that 9000 bucks doesn't just go into your pocket. It all goes back – Back into society. Into society. That's it all goes right. back through the shops, That's to the right. local butcher, through the local, you know, yeah, businesses. Yeah, the, pe- the petrol and, station. Yeah, it all – no one ends up at the end of it with 9000 bucks yeah. in their pocket. And uh, even if mm. they're drinking bottles of wine, it's going to somewhere. It's going yeah. back into the tax system. Yep. Oh, yeah. And uh, the people like Paul and Hanson don't seem to understand that because um, they tend to think, that side of politics te- seems to think that if you're a uh, person who receives money from the government, like Aboriginal people, for instance, you know, that they're out down at the bottle shop getting pissed and wasting their money and not looking for a job, you know, mm. I mean, 
like you said, it all goes back into society. It all uh, revolves. It, it all flo- it all floats back That's up. Right. You know, the trickle down economy. Is, That's right. It's, it's it's not. It's the evaporate up economy. <laughs> That's right. If you want to use water as an analogy, that's yeah. what happens. It always ends up going back up. That's right. That's right. Mm. So how's, how's your uh, painting coming along? Because I know you've, you've done a lot of uh, gallery work and uh, you collaborate with a, uh, another painter. Is that you're mm. still collaborating with? Um, yeah, Nick Morris, Nick his Morris name is. Yeah. And we have, a, um, we have a, and, uh, an alter ego called Doug Bartlett. So we work together on the same canvas. But at the moment we can't, of course. He lives in Torquay. And um, so that there's a bit of been a bit of a grind to a hold of that. So, so when you start a project like that on a bit of canvas, do you send? Is it? How do you work together like that? Do you both paint on the same canvas, or you we have both paint? We both. Well, say we're getting ready to do a show. We might know we need twelve paintings, and we really work on large scale because you can't fit all, you know, your own stuff onto a little canvas. We tried, and it just never really worked. So you have like each canvas coming sort of rotating through the studio from one easel to the next, then it dries, then it comes, then you do a bit more. And you you start with putting just background washes and splashes and colours and panels and stuff like that down. Like, like in music it would be like putting down the kick, you know, the kick, the yeah. kit, the bass, you know, and sort of mm. laying the bed, and yeah. then and then you add the details on top of that. Mm-hmm. And Nick has traditionally worked with silk screen, so he'll he'll have a big silk screen image, and I do freehand stuff, and then we'll just sort of jumble our images, sometimes over the top of each other, or you know, next to each other, and all, and then we'll black something out that we don't like, or I'll draw over the top of his print and you know so it just sort of slowly builds up um in a random way sort of it's never planned Mm. so that must be time consuming is that time consuming when you're in that process it is but sometimes sometimes it's faster in a strange way than doing it all yourself because you've got somebody else there making a decision for you yeah. When you're stuck by yourself in your own studio and you're working on a piece, you can drive yourself crazy mm. with, with indecision, like repainting something with four different colours and not deciding. But if you're working with somebody else and you might say, oh, I'll, I'll re, I need to re-change that colour, and then you put the paint out but it's already gone, you know, something else is already over the top of it. So you think, oh, well, thank God I don't have to make that decision. So in some ways it's... It can be easier and sometimes the paintings come together very quickly, mm. like they just work mm. instantly. It's like a simple folk song mm. compared to a symphony. Some of them take a lot of work. Yeah. Some of them just seem to land well, you know, like straight away. Mm. And we just both have to agree that there's nothing on there that we don't like that doesn't – That it's almost like an abstract sort of approach but using – figurative imagery and sometimes you sort of half get a message of something in there but you're never quite sure what it is but Mm. it sort of resonates in some way that has never been deliberately sort of planned Mm. but just sometimes it just how did you end up working did you work for Mambo Mambo Mambo, sorry Mambo Mambo you did work for them yeah how did you get involved with them well Nick and I the same guy do to Doug Bartlett with. We started, uh, we met at design school in Caulfield and then we started hanging out together and surfing together. And um, we were big fans of Mambo mm. as, as you know, sort of young designers watching what they were doing. Because that was Regmond. Regmond Bassa. Bassa, yeah. Well, the Mambo was run by a guy called Dare Jennings. Okay. And he was like this, this central kingpin of the whole thing. He, it was his kind of – he was the conductor of the whole thing. And Reg Mombasa was one of the artists that they used. Right. Now, he's clearly the most iconic one, mm. the one that stands out, that everyone remembers, but but he was just one of the artists working for Mambo. Right. Um, and everyone knows he was in mental as anything as mm. well. So. so was there a template that you had to follow? No. No? No. W- working for Mambo was great. Um. 
But to, the way I ended up at Mambo was Nick and I started our own clothing label called Umgawa out of Point Lonsdale in about 1990. And um, <laughs> the Umgawa comes from, you know, Tarzan <laughs> and um, also from the Huda Guru song, you know, yeah. Leilani. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we were doing our own thing and we, were, we got really successful, but we were idiots, you know. We, yeah. we weren't businessmen. Yeah. And it's that classic thing of you get too successful too quickly mm. and the whole thing falls over. Yeah. You know, like um, we just we took all these orders. We thought, oh, yeah, then we didn't have any money mm. to actually produce the orders, to, to fill the orders. So we had to borrow money at, you know, pro- what are, commercial rates to create the stuff mm. and ship it out and then wait to get paid. And then you can only do that for so long, mm. you know, it's like you're just like a rat on a wheel. Yeah. And then one of our big, um, one of the people we supplied, one of our big clients went bust and that was the end of us. We we just couldn't, you know, there was that. How, how long did that take before you got to that point? About five years. Oh, so you were there to the years. mid-90s. You were still yeah, yeah. plodding along. Something like that. Unbeknownst to us, Mambo, Dare Jennings, who was the Mambo um, boss, was really loving what we were doing. And uh, when the whole thing folded up, they, he actually got in contact with us. I can't remember how, but he must have known somebody. Actually, I think it was, was through Jeff Raglas. Okay. Because he was working for Mambo. So he got in touch with us and he, he flew us up there and said, you want to start doing some work for us? And I was just so stoked. Yeah. I thought, this is just like heaven. Mm. This is my dream come true. And, yeah. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so that was about 2000, I reckon. Is that screen printing more so than actual painting or? Well, for me, that was the transition in my career, really. Up to that point, all the artwork I'd done was from how I'd learnt at design school to get art ready for someone to screen print it. Okay. So I would basically create line art with, you know, arrows, this colour here, that colour there, and, you know, people, printers would get that, they'd know how to read that, and then they would do the screen printing. When I got to Mambo, I started doing it that way. And Dare said, no, 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 I want you to just do a painting. Just mm. send us a full colour painting. And then no. And we'll... Yeah. They had this fantastic guy there, Tony Clayton, who could do the, the separations. So that was when I first started actually thinking of myself as a painter, not as a designer. Mm. So I would do these beautiful full colour paintings for Mambo and it was... That, so that's the turning point. And then I got, and I realised, oh, this is so much more fun than, you know, doing this neat, precise line art, technical, you know, work. Um, and I, then I just started um, working on bigger and bigger canvases. And then Mambo fell over, like everything does. Eventually things, you know, fall over. They, they got brought out and um, by that stage I... I I'd sort of already started my arc. So my first exhibition was all my Mambo work. Okay. And then I had to do another show the year after that and then another one and then another one and then more shows and then I didn't have any more Mambo work so I had to start, you know, mining my own, you know, soul really for yeah. for, for material. And I remember Jeff yeah. Raglis uh Recording at Woodstock when I first started there in '97, mm. and uh, he had a band called the um, Feeling Groovies, and I know the yeah. artwork that he did for those albums were yeah. incredible. And I never made that connection that he'd worked for. Yeah, Mambo he, and, he did a lot of work for Mambo too. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realise. I mean, I could see it now in retrospect, yeah. the covers and you know, and the artwork yeah. that they were producing. But yeah, that's great. I didn't mm. had no idea that he was, he was working for him because I know that he was. Uh, he used to play in the Black Sorrows as a trumpet mm. player there briefly in the mid eighties and, uh, and the Bachelors from and Prague. The bachelors yeah. from Prague. I think basically Jeff and I have a slightly similar career. Kind of, he's done a lot of artwork for a lot of the bands that he's played in. Worked for Mambo. Now he's a solo artist, he lives on the coast. So we sort of share a sort of similar, you know, yeah, life process, sort yeah. of trajectory, yeah. Trajectory, yeah. 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 How, did, how did you start off working as a builder's labourer? Was that in the early 80s or mid 80s? That was about 88, late 80s, I reckon, yeah. How did you get a gig as a builder's labourer? Because I, I've got to admit, I tried in about 1985, and I remember I had friends from Newport uh, mm. who were all big 
bustly sort of guys, mm. and they were taking home over a thousand dollars being billed as labourers back mm. then, and that was good money. And they said, "Oh, you got to come. Just yeah. all you need to do is buy it." And that was during the uh, Bill. What was his name? That union guy, Norm Gallagher. Norm Gallagher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Norm Dodge. Gallagher. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he, they were part of the builders mm. labourers um, union. union. Yeah. And uh, so they, I went to the site, mm. and there was a whole bunch of people waiting. To, you used to get picked. You, mm. you, 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 you come in and do some a mm. day's work, and if we think you're all right, you'll get another day's, and you continue on sort of mm. thing. They went you, 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 and they looked at me. Go, and he was a Yugoslavian. He goes, "Boy, how old are you?" I said, "I'm 18." He goes, "No, you're 14." He goes, <laughs> "Come back when you put a bit more muscle on you." Yeah, he goes, that, yeah. this, this, "This will kill you," you know. I'm yeah. like, oh, "No, no, I'm serious. I, mm. I can do the job." You know, he wouldn't give me a go, mate. And uh, that was it. I ended that up working it. in a belt factory making belts and uh, for 120 <laughs> bucks a week. You know. <laughs> I was bitterly disappointed. <laughs> right. Well, um, I, unfortunately, I didn't have my snout in the trough, you know, of the um, of the union um, money. Uh, but I just worked for a builder building houses. Oh, right. Okay. I was working as a graphic designer three days a week, just one of my first jobs out of college. And the person I was working for, her brother-in-law was a builder. He was looking for someone to work for him a couple of days a week. And I thought, you know what? I've always wanted to do building and do something more physical, not just sit in this chair all day, you know. Mm. So, so I took the job on and um, and I loved it. I really loved it. And I, um, it sort of, you know, it changes your ability to look at things if you've done a job like that. Mm. You know, you're not scared of things like how to f- just fix things or put cut a hole in a wall or, you, you can know. be a bit ambitious, you know. Yeah, and you can sort of... Uh, you know, you walk into a hardware shop and you're not sort of all embarrassed and awkward about not sure what you want, you know, you and backing up a trailer up a hill and stuff. Like, just So anyway, so I jumped at that opportunity when it came along and I, and I really relished it. I really loved it. And um, But like everything else, it had to come to an end, you know. It, it, he didn't, it didn't – I was – for a while I was considering doing an apprenticeship but then um, – as a builder and then um, – we started up our clothing label and, you know, I sort of moved down the coast yeah. and <clears throat> didn't, never, never really did it. So moving down the coast, that was in Port Lonsdale, right? Port Lonsdale was where I first moved. It was pre the coastal boom, yeah. definitely, pre-sea change. Like yeah. Houses were so cheap down there then. I yeah. was just kicking myself that... Um, you didn't get one. Didn't yeah. even think of it. Yeah. But you could have got a house for 25 grand oh, no. or something. And... um. And all the locals were local locals, yeah, like right. fishermen, that's you know, right. and people who worked um, down there. And you go down there now, and it's totally different. Oh yeah, it's totally different. That the old what used to be the old wharf where all the sh- fishing boats were mm. in there, and just the fishing co-op now. This is all glamorous. Yes, it's all gift shops and yeah. um, yachts and. Yeah, because I've got friends who live up around uh, just before Apollo Bay. Yeah. Um, And uh, he's an artist as well, Mm -hmm. uh, but he's a recluse. He's uh, one of those artists that uh, moved away from the city about 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. uh, lived in a caravan on his family's property. But everything is so slow up there. Mm -hmm. Like I go and visit him and I'll say, He'll say, do you want a cup of tea? Mm. Yeah, okay, I'll have a cup of tea. Mm. And then we'll start talking about something mm. and then two hours will go by and I'll say, how's that cup of tea coming along? You know, mm. I'm still waiting for the cup of tea and then mm. don't ask for lunch because you'll be at five o'clock in the afternoon before you get lunch. But everything yeah. is so – they've got their own time. Do you notice mm. that? They're, everything is just so slow, you know, to get anything done. And, and you, if you get him to do anything art-wise, it right. just takes – an eternity, you know, mm. but he does great work. Yeah, it wasn't really like that at Point Lonsdale. It was, it's that that what you're talking about there is more like in Crete. <laughs> Crete, yeah. <laughs> That's sort of a t- totally different part of the world, anyway, from Point Lonsdale. Point Lonsdale was always closer to the to the city, and and the people I knew were all young, sort of crazy surf. Because mm. you grew up in the uh, rural areas. Uh, it, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up on Saint, in St Albans, but right on the edge, right on the fringe. Of what? Of the... Of, of the paddocks. Yeah, yeah. So you call that rural back then? Well, 
our closest neighbour was old Bill Harlock and he was a beef farmer. He had this old Victorian cottage and and that was directly over the road from our place and he had the cattle ramp and the beef and... So he was slaughtering the beef? No, the, the cattle trucks had come. Or in, sometimes in those days they'd actually drive them off with horses. Yeah, right. Incredible. Up, up Taylor's Road, probably taking them to Flemington. <laughs> <laughs> Sale yards, you know. Um you know, the cows would all come through our front yard and everything like that. So, yeah, it was rural. So I grew up, you know. Jeez, it wouldn't be. It's not yeah. nothing like that now. No, now that's all Taylor's Lakes, Kiel or oh, Downs, right. and it goes on and, and on, 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 water on. gardens yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So my childhood landscape is, is physically gone. And You would have had you know, a ball out there. You would yeah. have had, you know, cricket matches, football matches, yeah. you know. Yeah, rabbiting. And rabbiting. Lots of snakes. I wonder if the There's rabbits had mixo back in those days. A lot of it was pre-Mixo and then Mixo came in and that was not... not I mean, good. it was good for the country, but it wasn't I know people who actually rabbits. eat rabbits with Mixo. Do you believe that? Well, I, we caught, we used to catch rabbits and sell them for their skins. And the, the rabbits that had Mixo, they smelt bad. When you, when you, when you scun them, sure. they just didn't smell good. Yeah, sure. You, you, you sort of... The, you wouldn't be eating it them. It smelled right? different from a healthy rabbit yeah. and it didn't make you want to eat it. No. This guy eats them, mate. Right. This guy yeah, hits him. I'm, I'm, what I'm are amazed. his eyes like? I don't, <laughs> that's what I said. Yeah. Man, he's, you know, he gets some strange people mm. down in the country areas, mm. you know, the yeah. hardened people. I mean, I've mm. had a guy who's had, he's put a, uh, a one of those uh, nail gun mm. through his foot mm. and he pulled it out and, and wrapped it up and kept working, you know. Mm. I, I mean, I'm just amazed. I'd be like, take me to a hospital, get me a medic, you know. Yeah, like, give me only three weeks <laughs> off. Yeah. Yeah, give me three weeks off, yeah. you know. But yeah. these guys are incredible, yeah. you know. Like, And when he told me, I said, are you sure he's eating uh, rabbit with Mixo? Because that's not really healthy for, mm. your, for your health in mm. general, you know. But, you know, a lot of those things, like, it's just not going to cross species. Can, you don't you think know? so? Well, I, I think they would have done all their tests. I just don't think it would taste nice. No, I don't it think wouldn't. it's going to actually give you myxomatosis. Or make you sick. But did, did you eat rabbit as a child? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I you, still you, do. I like it. You've got a bit of Maltese in you, mate. Mm. There would have been a few Maltese around your area, wouldn't there? <laughs> a few, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty much, oh, look, in all seriousness, the, I didn't know many kids growing up who, who were Aussie Aussies, you know, the odd one, but most of them were Maltese or Yugoslav or... Slovenian, Croatian, yeah, but yeah, a lot of Maltese people. Um, in fact, I think at some point there was more Maltese people in. There were St. Albans, or, yeah. or was it Melbourne? No, or it's it in the, the it's in the west. It's more Maltese Mal- people in the western suburbs of western Melbourne suburbs than of there Mal- were in, in Malta. Malta. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so I grew up yeah with the pastizzi and all yeah. that stuff. There was a lot of Jewish people there selling jewelry. Did you come across that at all? No, but I didn't really spend much time in sunshine. Okay. I didn't notice that in St Albans. Okay. No. no. So did you – you played local football for Braybrook, did you? I played, I played for St Albans. St Albans. St Albans. They were the uh, and, Melbourne jumpers, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. And I did play for Braybrook later on. Okay. Because yeah. I always used to get mixed up sunshine, Braybrook – Maidstone, Maidstone yeah. you know, used to just – where are these places? I like, don't know where one starts yeah, and the other ends, ends, but they're all kind of – they're all – Why don't they just call it West Footscray, the whole thing? You know, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. But then West Footscray would be huge. Oh, it would be massive. It's mm. a bit like uh, Broad Meadows, mate, the city mm. of Hume. You know, mm. that goes out for miles. Yeah. But uh, isn't that where they had the latest meatwork uh, corona was in Maidstone? Did you hear about that? I did. I think it's in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, okay, that's which closer. is another one of those yeah, little, little cluster clusters, suburbs on, yeah. on the way out to um, yeah. on the way to Geelong. Yeah, that's yeah. I did hear that. Yeah. yeah, I wonder how they're coping with the situation. Well, some I was talking to somebody who knew somebody who who had actually worked for him, who had a friend who worked at that place, and what happens is they they employ all these um you know Indian and Pakistani students who all live in these shared flats. So yeah. one of them gets it, and they're all they're all got it, they, and it spreads, and that's how that one occurred. Occurred, yeah. 
But where it started from, I don't know. I, there was some rumour saying that somebody actually came and sold them all this cheap gear, you know, like face masks and stuff in exchange for were, meat, and, and they, they were commenting. Who knows? But who knows? Who knows? Who but, knows? Uh, I mean, you know, the live venue uh, scene is uh, decimated, mate. And it's a long way off to coming yeah. back, I think. The idea of having a room full of people yeah, dancing right. together on a dance floor, all sweating and yeah, you know, no. singing and laughing. I mean, God, how long to get to that? Yeah. Like, and as a musician, as a performer, that's what you want. For me anyway, to get enthusiastic about organising an online gig or sitting down gig with social spacing. I mean, no, you know, you've seen my show, you know, yeah. it's not... It's not it's, something it's, you can watch online, I don't think. There are some performers who can pull it through and they can, they can generate some energy through the through it, but I, I think other, a lot of people will, will struggle because it's very difficult. It's like mm. doing a Zoom podcast. Mm. It's very difficult to talk to a, a monitor and talk to someone overseas and yeah. try and get that connection. See, me yeah. and you are here. It's a, mm. it's, you get the vibe. You can pick up on things. You can, mm. There's things that you just can't explain. It's the same with uh, live music. If you yeah. go and see a live band that you really dig and you got the energy up, it's terrific. You mm. can't you can't replicate that in in, in your no. bedroom, you know. No, like if you had the budget to even go to a really good studio with great cameras, in you know, it's not even it about might, that. You might pull it off. Yeah, but it's, I don't. I don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, if you look back and. To the late seventies on night moves when they used to do live at the Palais Theatre, mm. you know, and stuff like that for Channel Seven. Uh, you know, you'd you'd see all these bands play, and but the thing that made it uh, poignant was the crowd because mm. they'd be throwing streamers, they'd be throwing mm. toilet paper. It, mm. You could hear the crowd clapping. You could you you get this sense, even though they were very they were far away from the mm. performers because the stage is so big at the Palais. You could still get a sense of mm. a vibe, you know what I mean, and uh, I think that's a tricky one to try and capture that in a small venue. You know, we're struggling with that. I mean, I just know we we spent three years trying to um, uh, put things to air and trying to, yeah, yeah, trying to sort of capture mm. some uh, mm. some part of the uh, population yeah. to tap into it. You know, it's very difficult because. Pre-corona, you know, you've got to understand that music has taken a back seat to a lot of other things, you know, like Netflix, going to the cinema, um, whatever it is, you know, mm. uh, nightclubs, whatever it is. There's a lot of choice. Kids, like when we were growing up, we only had football in winter, cricket in summer, music all year round, you know, mm. and, and we had something to – we could gravitate to it, to it, you know. That's my dog, mm. mate. Yeah. Just, he's having a bit of a – <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it's, but you know the other. But the other flip side of the coin is that those music festivals are huge now. You know, there is still a lot of people going out to see bands, maybe just different age demographics or whatever. The positive thing about music festivals is you get a chance to to get a cross pollinated audience. Mm. It's not just the same people that come to see you. You can get up on stage and strut your stuff in front of thousands of people yeah. who would otherwise never have seen you. That's true. And um, also, it, festivals in rural areas take culture to that place. I mean, local, all the kids from the local farms or the local towns and stuff who would yeah. probably not come to the city or not be able to come to the mm. city to see a band yeah. get to see it happen in their own backyard. That's true. You That's know. true. Something like uh, Summer of Soul. Have you pl- performed there? No. Yeah, I've done that. That's in Gippsland. Um, do you know about it? Yeah. I've, there's... There's one up. There's, a, there's so many Min- now, but there's, there's one I've been to up near Lee and Gather. Minion Hotel, Minion. Minion, I Minion. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the same guy. He mm. runs that. And he runs the Summer of Soul right. um, festival. But uh, I did one at Lake Tyres. That that didn't la- didn't last actually. But you know what I'm saying? Like, how many kids who gr- live up in East Gippsland? are going to get to go and see all these bands. That, oh, yeah, definitely, you know, that, definitely. So, you know, that's a positive and it brings, you know, life and excitement. Oh, and, don't get me wrong. I, 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 having done the Summer mm. of Soul out in Gippsland, I mm. can see the community. It's old school, man. It's mm. like going back 50 years almost, you know, mm. the scaffoldings 
the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's uh, they got you got volunteers. You got Marv who works at the farm down the road who mm. sells milk during the day, coming down and helping you put up the speaker. You know, that's mm. the sort of vibe. Yeah. The, the problem that he ran into, unfortunately, uh, and I could see this coming because I worked on that festival for about five or six years each year. Mm. And when we, he could get incredible talent playing yeah. on that festival. Um, international acts, you know, mm. uh, Paul Kelly, you know, a whole heap of people played on that. Um, and I could see the problem occurring because he used to rely heavily to make it financial on the volunteers of the local area. Yeah. The problem is uh, insurance, as you know, occupational mm. health and safety kicked in. There's all these regulations. You can't get someone who's not trained to lift a speaker or a lighting or touch a lighting rig or anything mm. like that. They can't. I mean, I know for me, I think if you can sum up somebody, you can talk to them, you can, you can, you can show them away on a, on a uh, stage and you mm. can tell them to do X, X, X and Y and they can do it. I don't think there's any problem with that, but the problem is the law. And as soon as someone gets hurt or injured, mm. that, that's it. For, that there's no more festival. Yeah. Because he'll get sued, the PA company will get sued, everyone will get sued, you know. So it's a very delicate, fine line and I think it's that's a real shame. That's the one that I think it's uh, been blown out of proportion is that occupational health yeah. and safety um, concept of yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you, you, there, there are sh- shocking photos of conditions that people have worked in in the past and things had to get, safety has to improve, but then you think, has it gone too far in other yeah, areas? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, people, got- this fear of litigation, you know, is, is um, I remember when with the, my band, the New Bowls first started touring and you're the support act and part of being the support act is you've got to load in and load out the mm. PA with the road crew, right? Yeah. So you got, you're getting paid hardly anything to, to play, yeah. but like we toured with the Hoodoo Gurus and bands like that, and um, so you finish your gig, drink your rider, wait for the other band to finish, keep drinking, and then you got to help these guys load yeah. these PAs down these huge, yeah. you know, those Sydney yeah double bin double Sydney clubs like yeah. um. Cronulla, yeah, sharks, shark, or, yeah. yeah, I know, and those big staircases, yeah. and they PAs in those days were, were massive, huge and yeah. heavy. Like yeah, yeah. they hadn't realised, you know, maybe we can make all this stuff a bit lighter and smaller. Yeah, <laughs> like bigger, better, heavier, better. Yeah. So, and they were and they were hardwood too. I mean, yeah. it was heavy stuff. And we're untrained. Yeah, like or just basically still teenagers, that's almost right. pissed, carrying all this heavy stuff for free. Yeah, that's right. Down the stairs. That's right. And you think, well, that wasn't a good situation either. No. <laughs> you know? so, and hence that's why occupation. So somewhere in between. In. Somewhere, yeah, that's right. Somewhere in between. Yeah. Well, now, you, like you say, the, the equipment's a lot lighter, which is yeah. good. And so it's a lot more uh, flexible in, yeah. terms, in terms of setting it up, packing it down, so that you don't yeah. have that issue of, yeah. you know, that heavy W bins and yeah. all that. So that's what you're talking about, yeah, that yeah. big stuff, you the know. Um, well, but one, one thing I did learn from that, experience though or those experiences was how to actually pick something up yeah. properly how to carry something yeah. properly h- how to stack things in a back of a truck and that's a, right so they don't all fall over and that's right you, you know when you see someone you, you, you go to pick something up with somebody and you, and you've because you've done that so many times they're mm. that heavy you've got to sort of you just start doing it and then you realize that the other person's got no idea mm. how to Carry something, how to carry and it something. puts a lot of pressure on you because yeah. you're carrying it properly, mm. and uh, it can injure you. Mm. That's the problem. So with that. yeah, you, I find myself having a coach. Yeah, and then you don't want to sound like you know you know everything That's either. It. So you're sort of trying to be gentle. So That's right. You'll find it a bit easier if you just let's just tilt That's it over right. and carry it like that. That's right. Yeah. So what's uh, planned for you post uh, Corona? Well, Are you doing I've the got- um, Scott Walker tribute? Oh look, yes, we've got the Scott. We've got Scott Walker shows they've got bookings in october okay and i've got um where's where is the bookings do you know well one was at the spotted mallard which is no longer which is just being sold has it been sold someone paid well it's up for sale yeah so who knows Mm. see there's and who knows if gigs are going to be up and running by then anyway you know everything's such there's so much uncertainty but um yeah, so they were booked for the Spotted Mallard and Memo Music Hall. Okay. Um, 
And then we had been booked to do the Boogie Festival. Okay, yeah. And that's got a new date, which is in November. Oh, right. So when it's usually in March, right? Yeah, we got, it got yeah. wiped out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was um, – God, I can't remember the exact date, but, yeah, it was one of the first things. Because that that's a pretty big uh, lineup you got for the Scott Walker show. You've got backing singers, you've got keyboard players. Well, we've got Dave Graney and Claire Moore. We've got Shane Riley on pedal steel mm-hmm. and guitar. We've got a girl called Mogi Morgan. Yeah. On vocals and keys, we got um, Stephen Hadley on bass, Jack Howard on various horns, Bruce gotcha. Holmes on keyboards, gotcha. and so Steve Hadley on bass. Yeah? And Steve Hadley on bass. Yeah. So what's and and then there's me and Rob Snarsky. Oh wow! So that's quite a lot. So of So that's nine of us, I yeah. think. Is it? Yeah. That's quite a lot. Yeah. I mean, he's got a very eclectic range of music Scott Walker I mean if you listen to the Walker Brothers as you yeah. as you are aware you know yeah. that style of singing that he was doing there transformed mm. vastly different uh, by the time he got into the mid 80s I, yeah. I mean do you do that cross section of his work or? not not really I think um Dave Graney might be tweaking some of the set and I think maybe he's going to put some of that avant-garde sort of stuff oh, in yeah. there but I don't know yet. I'm not. Okay. I'm not exactly sure. Is it Dave Graney's baby, or it's kind of yeah. Stephen Hadley's baby? And I think, and Dave Graney's probably more closely connected with Steve. Yeah. During the creative sort of massaging okay. of the project. I mean, you, there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of material mm. um, there to choose from because yeah. uh, he was an incredible artist. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, like I said to you earlier, like uh, I've worked with Jeff Duff and uh, he did a Scott Walker tribute um, in 2017, I think it was, at Birds. And, mm. uh, but he only had, you know, it was only a five-piece band mm. <clears throat> and he had a violin player, electric mm. violin player, and they're all Sydney people. Mm. And he played a lot of that cross-section from mm. that period, from the late 60s right up until yeah, um, the late early 90s even, you know. Because that avant-garde stuff, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was given one of his CDs, I mean, I know the, the Hunter, was it The Hunter, that mm. mid-80s album? I think it was called The Hunter. And that I really like that album. I, mm. I reckon there's there's 10 songs on there and each one of those songs is just incredible, you know, mm. like a really good album. And that's he went more pop on that album. Mm. It was more that sort of 80s pop. I don't know much stuff off that album. Um, I know mainly that late sixties, early seventies okay. kind of era, and of course I've heard samples mm. of his other stuff, but it's pretty hard to listen to. I mean, Montague and <laughs> Blue is a great song. Yeah, that, I get that one. Yeah, that's a great song. That's one of my um songs, and I get to do the um most of the blockbuster hits. Okay. You know, the, <laughs> I'm singing. The I mean, hits. I mean, do you remember him being a kid? Do you remember recall I that period? I really clearly remember no regrets. No regrets. Okay. Being on the radio, I remember. I've even got a clear memory of it in my mind. Driving through the hills of Omeo in my uncle's truck, and that song come on the AM radio, and just thinking, oh, this is just something else. Something else. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was because – have you seen the documentary he, that David have, Bowie yeah, did yeah. for him? I mean, what did you, that was just incredible, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was surprised that he passed away. When I got told that he had passed, mm. I was pretty shocked, to be honest mm. with you, because it didn't seem like he had, he had any underlining health issues at that stage. He looked pretty good for his age. Yeah, he was fit. He was skinny. He was – yeah, you know, but um, but I just like the way he uh, improvised. He put that uh, he he brought a piece of steak or it was mm. a rump or something, and they're banging on the rump and they're getting that sound. Yeah, I thought it was like a whole half of beef. Yeah, that's right. Whole it, side was. Of beef. it was. It was in the studio. <laughs> in the studio. Yeah, that's right. Mm. I, I love that sort of stuff. You know, <laughs> I really do. I really. Yeah. I, I wish I could work with people who do that stuff. You know. Yeah, well, the beef, beef is pretty expensive these days. I know. You'd, you'd have to get free range, you know, grass fed. <laughs> and then <laughs> sustainable beef. Could too. you imagine if they were? I mean, what, I wonder what they did with the carcass of that once they beat it. Because I mean, well, I hope they didn't chuck it in the bin. Yeah, you know, I reckon there would have been a good possibility that mm. they did. But mm-hmm. um, he did some great work, and uh, I actually worked with uh, 
one of his musicians that had worked with him back mm. in the uh, 70s yeah who came out with one of the bands that a jazz outfit that came to birds i mean it's interesting all these bands that we used to get from overseas um mm. there's always that one person who you go that you know you sit down and have a coffee with them upstairs and mm. they tell you oh yeah i was the drummer for michael jackson's band for 10 years you know during right, the thr- right. and you just go wow you know yeah. i had no idea you know yeah i mean there were so many guys like that you know and that's the difference between i think australia and america you know like if you're living in new york mm. uh and you're really at your peak of your instrument and you're being employed by all these different acts. Mm. Um, you know, you get to play with an, an eclectic. Yeah, uh, there's. Of a, I think that's that's one thing that a lot of people who aren't in the music sort of industry. And I always hate using that term, but why? You know, don't realize how much cross pollination there is. Yeah, oh, you, you think oh, there's that band and there's yeah. that band, but all these people all working with each other and in different projects and playing on on each other's recordings and you know. It's um that's something that I really love too. Yeah, all all that stuff. You know, working with different people on different things. Well, so. well you get a lot. I think it keeps things fresh, doesn't mm. it? Because you're getting different energies. Yeah. And if you're working with the same people all the time, I think the energy can stagnate. Yeah. I think that's the best word I can use for it. You know, so mm. if you get someone fresh, you can bring new ideas to the plate. Uh, you it can sort of it, it can work in both ways. I reckon mm. it could either really go positive or it could go a bit skew with depending yeah. but on but if it goes skew with it's it's all not that bad because it might just be one project you know like bands can often really implode and just freewheeling through all different projects and stuff like that is um is fun too for us so, so you're but, still doing the Hugh Jane Hamilton yeah. show well, yeah I've also had this sort of side project going for a long time all of you <laughs> A few, but one I want to talk about is um, I have an original band. Oh, great! Called the Endlings. It's basically a trio with my wife Alice on cello, and another friend of ours called Dee Hannon. She plays mandolin and and she sings. She's got a beautiful voice. Like her and her three sisters, always harmonised really well, and they've sung with Paul Kelly and okay. they've done all sorts of projects over the years. So at the moment, this is one of the good things of. Um, of lockdown, we Alice is setting up a proper home recording studio, okay. and she's doing a proper online course to get all the proper, you know, information. It's one of those um, Berkeley College, oh yeah, online courses, yeah. And she's a SWAT, you know. She yeah. she'll get everything. She'll get it. So we're going to start recording that. Beautiful. And it's um. So everyone's in their own homes recording and. Well, we haven't. Alice and I are just sort of laying down the bass tracks yeah. at the moment, and she's just still getting the. Con- grasping the concepts yeah. of, of ha- how the whole thing works. Okay. So that's something that's <laughs> that, that I'm looking forward to and enjoying sort of getting my teeth into that because that's been going for a long time and we've written a lot of songs and we've had lots of rehearsals. We've done the odd little gig here and there. They both played with George Xaluris in the Xaluris Ensemble. Irish music is pretty strong in Dee's history yeah. and Alice is like cas- classically trained. Yeah. Um, and I come from sort of a rock real yeah. background if I have to pick one. Rock, you know, <laughs> slash country sort of thing. You had the Kiss T-shirt, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but the, the country music I love is the is early late sixties, early seventies stuff like Bobby Gentry and Glen Campbell. You know, songs like Galveston and oh, yeah. you know that sort of it's sort of country, but with yeah, a yeah. bit more of a landscape. And sure. so it's sort of a combination of like. Folky country, yeah, sounds good. Bit of Jim Webb, you know that sort of songwriting style with um, but it's pretty dark. Yeah, it's 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 pretty um. Well, a cello can make the things, moods are pretty yeah. about loneliness and sort of yeah, you know the, that kind of stuff. Good titles for the winter period, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's the best time yeah. to record this stuff, mate. It's mm. winter because you can really. Mm. embellish that with through yeah. the weather, you know. Yeah. That's what I always find. It's funny. I'm always more drawn to sad. Yeah, music is sad songs, and I tend to write sad songs. Okay, there was a band called the Cowboy Junkies. Did you mm. get into them at all? I uh, not really. I remember the name. But okay, I, I was I used to listen to their mm. first CD, and I got to the point where I was just going to make a decision. It's either off the Westgate Bridge or all, all the CDs going off the Westgate Bridge. All oh, right, it was that <laughs> bad, was it? <laughs> and I, yeah. I and I and I chose the the, the CD, mate. I got to tell you. I 
love, always loved footy. Just loved, loved, loved it. Loved footy cards. Loved watching footy on TV. Loved footy pictures. Loved, you know, like I kept scrapbooks of great marks that I cut out of the paper. I've still got them all. You got Jez's? Uh, that was pre my collection. The first mark I ever cut out and put in in my scrapbook was Peter Moore taking a mark over Mike Fitzpatrick. Yeah, right. And he sort of spins around. Yeah, I think I was down. at I was at that game. No. Are you a Collingwood man? No, Bulldogs. Yeah, Bulldogs, Western Suburbs. Yeah. No, so no, my aesthetics for when it came to footy um, and keeping the pictures out it had not was non non tribal, mm. non partisan. Yeah. Um, but I started footy and I was just terrible. Yeah. Like, had no confidence, sort of couldn't run really fast or anything, was pretty plodding around and hardly ever got the ball. And if I did get the ball, I panicked and, you know, kicked it as fast as I could. And, um, <laughs> and my, um, my, my, my dad used to buy my footy boots and they were always these really old, daggy footy boots, which he probably thought were beautiful, mm. vintage, lovely, you know, yeah. Jenkins, handmade in Tasmania. I can imagine the aesthetic appealing to to someone. Were they the studs? Did they have yeah, studs? Jenkins with the big studs, and um, you know, you sort of as soon as you put your boots on, you know, you felt crap. You know, everyone else had these shiny new Adidas ones on, and you had your old big clod hoppers. You know, they'd call them. Clod so hoppers. you just had you just ran out <laughs> on the ground with no confidence or anything like that. And then when I left, that, and I was at boarding school then, right? It was when I left boarding school and I got my own job packing shelves at the local supermarket. I bought myself my own footy boots for the first time and they were black Adidas ones, low cut, you know, with bright orange stripes. And my football career changed that day. I started getting confident. I felt good when I ran out, you know. I just, that difference in confidence just transformed me. And I actually slowly but surely became one of the good players in the team. And then I got to the point where I actually got invited to train with the Bulldogs. Mm. It wasn't like now, it wasn't, they didn't have a draft. It was just a local, the local, what do they call it, the Footscray football, the junior development squad. Yeah. So then they put two or three kids or, from all the local teams. Yeah. By this stage I was playing seniors for St Albans, but I was probably still 18 or 19. That was such a thrill. I remember going to the Western Oval and my best friend, as well, he got picked as well. So this is the play for Footscray in the play for, to play for, Yeah, you would have been trying to get into Footscray in the okay. yeah. So you went to Footscray, trained on the football on the Western Oval mm. every Sunday morning mm-hmm. with the Footscray coaching staff. Yeah. And um, I remember the first time I walked in and they weigh you and they measure you and they, you know, you know, you have to run on the thing and they take all these measurements and stuff. Wow. I remember Doug Hawkins was standing in the corner just mm. sort of talking to another player or something, just sort of watching us all come in. G'day, kids, how you going? Good to see you. Welcome to the club and all that kind of stuff. And I just was like floating on air and I just was thinking, they're going to find out they picked the wrong kid. <laughs> Sooner or later, they're going to realise. Um, <laughs> Had you won a best in Ferris or anything like that before that? or No, no, I hadn't, but I was hovering around there. You okay. Know. There was this... I played all these games for St Kilda, like one of those plays you never really noticed. But it, and I was speaking to him one night at a gig, and I said, oh, yeah. and we were talking about footy, and I said, so what was your junior football career like? And he said, he said, mate, I never stood out, I never won a best and fairest, but I just slowly kind of wow got better and better, and someone noticed me, and I got picked to play in one game, and just on that game they picked me for the next one, and then next thing you know, I'm there, and I'm. Playing games. You know, it's interesting know. how uh, yes. pe- people get invited to play for the, mm. these AFL, VFL teams, AFL teams. Mm. I mean, when I was playing at AMBY, we were getting beaten by, you know, 50 goals every mm. game, you know, but we had this gun player. Mm. He was a champion. Mm. I mean, he used to just destroy teams by himself. And when, when he would play, we'd just lose, you know. We're always yeah. on the cusp of winning but just get pipped. And then we were playing spots with that particular day and there was a big crowd and, you know, we were in front at three-quarter time. Mm-hmm. I got flattened because I was a, a fast-running forward pocket wing sort of player. Mm-hmm. So I was out because I got winded and, I, and that was the first time I got winded. And yeah, it's a horrible it's feeling. It's terrible. Yeah. And, um, and Grant freaked out because, I was, because he saw me getting down behind play and he mm-hmm. started punching up the whole team, right? He went psycho, you know, and yeah. he's had to go at the umpire, the whole – and I'm just like, oh, no, you know. 
they took him off the ground and, you know, he was, he was a bit psycho, you know, mm. but um, – and then obviously we lost the game. But uh, if he had a, kept his cool, mm. we would have won a lot more games because he was just a really yeah. gun player, you know. Yeah. You think these days well, – the way the draft system works, you're not going to ever be that kid up. No. Unless you've won all these best and fairest mm. and stuff like that along the way. But when the Bulldogs won their flag in 2016 – there were so many players on that list on that day who were off the rookie list. Yeah, right. Who hadn't come through the system. Mm. Um, like Dale Morris, Picken, Luke Dalhouse, and Jason Johannesson, who won the Norm Smith that day. And there's Matthew Boyd. Yeah, right. Well, that's five. Five, yeah. And I think there's another one too. But anyway, that's definitely five out of a squad of 22. Yeah. Nearly a quarter of the team That's right. has not come from the glory yeah. pathway. Well, They've, that that shows you something, doesn't it? Does, it does. It does show you something. So, you know, there's hope. Anyway, so to cut a long story short, that I never made the cut yeah. to under 19s, but I went back to play for St Albans. But I was falling in love with surfing. Yeah. And weekends, footy, surfing. I still love playing footy, but then we got this Robbie McGee, the, the oh, infamous yeah. Robbie McGee took over as coach. Right. Of the St Albans seniors, Robbie McGee, the notorious the, Robbie McGee, the notorious, yeah, yeah. Right. handlebar mo, yeah. skinny tats, yeah, because yeah. yeah. I think he's originally from Yarraville, isn't he? Or? Yeah, I think so. I think he, well, he actually started at Footscray before he went yeah, to right. Richmond. Okay, yeah, so he's from the western suburb somewhere. I remember I used to play against him because he was playing in the ruck for West Footscray, and I would be playing in the centre for St Albans. So he was already a menacing figure. Anyway, he became the coach of St Albans. And there was one game, we were down three-quarter time, you know, we were only you know, maybe a goal, eight points or something down, and he came out and he said, right, at the start of this last quarter, I want to see every one of you guys deck the fucking cunt next to you. <laughs> and if you don't, and I just thought, what? <laughs> You know, <laughs> and of course I didn't, and not my, most people didn't. You yeah. know, but but he, he kind of just, I just thought, oh, fuck this, I can't yeah. do this. No, anymore. this is ridiculous. So the, that, at the end of that season, I just didn't bother going. That back. that wouldn't exist in this day and age. I wouldn't imagine. I don't. Th- oh, you'd you wouldn't. You hope not. So that was well. That was pretty much the end of my football career. I, I, I dabbled. I played a few games for Anglesey because I was kind of spending so much time in it. Do so they wear the Melbourne jumpers as well? No, they wore the North jumpers. Okay. And then I sort of came back half-heartedly and played a few games, still in the Footscray District League. But I was, I was basically loyal to this guy called Harry Schiltz, who was my old coach. So where whoever he was coaching, I'd go and play for. Them. Yeah, right. Oh, that's very kind of you. Um, yeah. Do what I can, Pete. <laughs> um, you do the community, but, but, but that community was, so service. So I played some games for North Sunshine okay. and then a couple of games here and there for Braybrook, but th- yeah, no, that's about it. My last games were for a North Footscray. I went and trained for North Footscray mm-hmm. and uh, it was January and they would have had at least 50 kids, I reckon. Right. You know, what I found though, there was a common theme with the administrators of football clubs mm. and they're always white Anglo guys, you mm-hmm. know, and it was very hard as a chocolate, curly-headed Maltese guy. And mm. even even if you were Greek or Italian or, you know, if you're Southern European, it was very difficult back in those days to break in to the team. Mm. Even if you're really, really good, you know, mm. like uh, I remember my training session at North Grey, I, I racked up something like 40 possessions or something. I just destroyed them, you know. Mm. And he didn't pick me for the game, you know. He, he put me as a reserve and I just couldn't believe it. I'm just like – and I said, look, mate, I'm uh, – not playing, you know, see you later, mm. you can... And then they rang me up about two weeks later, come and play, we'll give you a game. I said, no, no, don't worry, it's fine, mate. I'll and that was uh, retire. It. I just said, that's it, I've mm. had enough. Because it yeah. was all through my junior football career right up to that point was always a bit like that, even though we won premierships with mm. Altona Central as a under nines and stuff like that. And I was on the... Uh, I was Rover slash half forward flank, which a lot of those kids went off and played for Spotswood and they became mm. legends of Spotswood, you know. That's how I knew that Spotswood was, was a strong team because when I went to a and and I met up with my mm. ex-teammates, uh, I knew we're in trouble because these guys are killers, you know. They're, yeah. they're <clears throat> I'll never forget, there was a guy called Terry Love who played for Spotswood. Great player. And <laughs> like a Trevor Barker style. Yeah. Blonde, long blonde hair. Just flew over the packs, took mark after mark. And he was quite slightly built. In fact, he was like pretty much identical to Trevor Barker. Yeah, right. And he just dominated at that 
age group at that level. He actually did play a couple of games for the Bulldogs, but the step up, he gets up to the, that level and he's just not quite yeah, good Yeah, it's enough, weird, isn't it? You know? Yeah. It's just because everyone there has, is just that. Like one thing that I realised when I did that, sort of short session at the Footscray Development Squad thing was that I was pretty good at doing what I did, but there were kids who were just as good as me at doing it, but they were that much faster than me mm. and they were that much taller than yeah. me. And I could just couldn't never, ever compete with them. Yeah, right. And then there were kids that were just a thousand times better at me at everything. But you gotta, too, you got to you know, so. you look at someone like Diesel Williams, you know, mm. he was slow... Not very tall, but he just knew how to read the play, you know. But but, but he was exceptional yeah. at that. Yeah. He was exceptionally yeah. he was. good at that. You know, his his spatial awareness yeah. was something out of this world, know. you know. So I know. So the only reason he can play is because of that exceptional talent. Yeah, talent, yeah. Not just pretty good at this and slow and yeah. whatever. Yeah. That's right. And there's a lot of players like that too. I played for South Melbourne. I got asked to train with South Melbourne mm-hmm. um, when I was 15, 16, yeah. just before I went to North Footscray. And Silver, Silvio Fashuni had just left. Yeah. But they were still at the Lakeside Oval. Yeah. Um, they hadn't moved to Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a, their last year was always just in that turmoil year. And I think that's why they were in turmoil because they decided to pick people like me for their under-19s. I'm just right. like... And I just went there on a training night and they gave mm. me socks and jumper. Because Mark Browning, do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. He used to be my uh, technical school uh, coach. Right. And when I was in Year 7, uh, we played – well, we, we were going to play the uh, – what was that uh, night series? At the the Escort Cup. The Escort Cup, yeah. yeah. Yep. And it used to be – what you had to do to qualify in your region, you'd have to play – you know all your local schools, and then once you, if you, if you won those tournaments, then you'd have to go and play something with someone like Essendon Grammar. Mm. And if you beat Essendon Grammar, then you can go on and play. It was the Herald Shield. It was the Herald yeah. Shield. Yeah, because we right. won it one year. Oh, you won it. Yeah. What what school? Chisholm was that? College of Braybrook. They won it. Yeah. Wow, that's it was the great. only time. I think there's only. It was always Assumption or yeah, Mazenod or that's whatever. Right. But we won it one year. Fantastic. I'll never forget it. What colours did you guys wear? It Black? was maroon and white. Maroon and white. Was it a V? It was like a Melbourne jumper. Okay. But maroon with a white V. Okay. Mm. Did yeah. you play in that tournament? No. I played in every game except the grand final. Okay. And I was on the I was I was on the I was named for the grand final and then in the change rooms under the ground in the stadium before you ran out, they'd tap me on the shoulder. Made a change. And said you're not playing. Yeah, bugger. <sighs> yeah. How did you feel? Oh, devastated. Devastated, yeah. Yeah, it was very hard for me to celebrate that victory yeah. with the rest of the school and everyone when I just felt gutted. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And were you boarding? Was that where you were boarding? No, no, no. no that, was, that was at Salesian College out in Sunbury. Okay. No, Chisholm College is in Braybrook. It's, right. It's, it's actually right next to Skinner Reserve. Okay. On. Did Doug Hawkins come from that school? No, he would have. I think he just came from Braybrook High. Okay. But anyway, finish your story about... South Melbourne. South Melbourne, yeah. yeah. And uh, do you remember a guy called Witzel? I do remember yeah, that. He, yeah, he came from A&B Wise Walk, but right. his father was the president. Right. He got through because of his father, I reckon. Mm. You know, they had ties with South Melbourne. And yeah. um, anyway, so... That th- did happen. That happened all oh, the yeah, time. absolutely. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, I just got asked to go down and train because they saw me mm. play. It was one, one of those games where you just... You're everywhere mm. and you just pick up a whole bunch of – It just of, lands in your hands as you're running past you. And one of the scouts was there and, he, and that's why I ended up training with them on mm. one particular – and then I just couldn't – like you say, I, mate, as soon as I went there, I was just like puffing my guts out. Mm. I was just like, how are you going to keep up with these guys? You know, there's mm. no way. You know, I, I wasn't very confident. Once mm. I kept having to st- – because I was only a small guy mm. – and I'm 15, um, it's very difficult to see yourself progressing mm. from where you are. You know, that's what I found. I was just like, I'm never going to get to this. I'm, and that, I'm, my hat's off to people who can see their vision, even though everything's stacked up against them, you know, yeah. but they can still, yeah. you know, travel through that. Uh, but, yeah, mine was – I was wrapped just to get the socks and the jumper, you know. <laughs> yeah. Still got them? No. Nah. No. Nah. Because I was a Carlton supporter and I would yeah. have done anything to play for Carlton under nine ends, mm. you know, mm. back then, you know, but I wasn't in the zone because North Altona for some reason was in the South Melbourne zone, which is weird because I thought it would have been Footscray, but it, it wasn't. Yeah, it's like it, um, 
the docks kind of thing. Williamstown yeah. and stuff were connected to South Melbourne. Was Williamstown I, as well? I think yeah. so. Well, some of those suburbs seem to be yeah. in the South Melbourne zone. Yeah. And it must be it must have something to do with the docks. Docks, yeah, bit. I think so. Well, the water, you know, it's not the that water, far, yeah. you know, yeah. when you think about it in Ks, you know. Yeah. My first ever game, I went to the Lake Soda Oval in the mid-70s. Mm. My brother-in-law barracked for South Melbourne and mm. I remember he took me to one of their games and stuck me on the race, you know, the Cora Guide. Mm. What was it? Was that sort of still... Cyclone t- netting? Netting, yeah. yeah so you, I was so on you t- could he spit put on me the on, players. <laughs> <laughs> I was, he put me on top of that and we went at half time because it was free to get in. Mm. But uh, I remember the atmosphere. That That's what sh- took me back. Mm. The atmosphere was just so electric, you know, yeah. around the ground, you know. Yeah, that's what I miss. I mean, you can't. I don't think you can get that at these bigger venues. You don't get same thing. We're, we're talking about yeah. music. You know, you go to a club, you get that electrifying vibe. You know, yeah. but you go to a big yeah that that particular mood from those suburban grounds is really a different beast. Yeah, than going to Docklands. Yeah, totally. The MCG, like when it's pumping and it's packed. You it's sort of, still, but it's still not the same. Nah. It, it's not, there was a sort of a strange blend of intimacy and yeah. and sort of like every ground had its own particular sort of flavour yeah. and sort of atmosphere. One thing that is good about m- women's footy is that feeling. Yeah, I take my daughter and boys to see the women's teams yeah. play. And it's much more like that atmosphere yes. used to be. It's yes, a, it's, it's local football. It's local football, and the the uh, I don't know, just like all the, the there just seems to be this great mood of yeah. of positivity, yeah. and and, and it, like the girls running around, yeah. Yeah. you know, they've got something to scream for, and yeah. there's some in some ways, if you want that feeling of what footy used to be like that. Go to the women's footy yeah. now, or even the VFL as yeah. well is the same. I go to the practice yeah. matches. Yeah, you know the AFL practice when they mm. played at uh, Optus Oval. Yeah, I think it still has that element. You know, mm. like I, the last game I went and saw was Brisbane Carlton just before we had Corona, and yeah. uh, I was just, you know, it's sort of mm. it was great to reminisce. You know, but yeah. I, I could see the degradation of the seats mm. and all that. You yeah. could just see the the stands haven't been kept up. You know, mm. there's no money there like there yeah. used to be, you know. It's I'll tell you where I did go recently. I saw the Bulldogs play in Ballarat. Okay. Would it have been cold? It was freezing, <laughs> but it had that old atmosphere. Yeah. You know, it's... Was this an you, AFL see, match? It or? was a, yeah, it was yeah. a proper AFL yeah. match. Bulldogs-Brisbane. You could actually see the, the stands of people, the terraces mm. of people standing, and then mm. a cameraman perched at the top on a little platform, then there's yeah. huge gum trees over here, then the big old scoreboard. Yeah. And you're watching the whole ground, you're watching the whole thing from ground level pretty much. So when someone flies up to take a mark, behind them is all the people's faces. You know, it's not just grass. Yeah, so that's you see it. everyone go, <sighs> Yeah, that's right. And you get that, you got that sort of. Oh, and and have you got guys walking feeling. around selling pies? Not there, they weren't. No, no that's, a, that's not what where you, we you were. Need that. You need the white. You know, you yeah. need the kid with the white jacket to going, come to you. Hot pies, yeah, and you know, chocolate drinks and potato chips. That I used to like that mm. kid because uh, you know we yeah. were very cheeky as uh, young teenagers, and we used to go, "I'll oh, give us one of those." Mate, put his head down, and then someone come from the side and grab a few of those, uh, you know. Chips and <laughs> we'd get a few free ones, you know. You devil! <laughs> Remember there was a there was a guy at the Western Oval who used to sell peanuts. Yeah, the old guy with the peanuts, yeah. peanuts, 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 <laughs> and, and he'd chuck them to he'd chuck them, right. and people would chuck them. Yeah, back. I know, right? Yeah, I and mean, he, usually he, you couldn't see him. You just see these peanuts come flying yeah. out of the air. And, and, and I used to love that man. Mm. You know, I used to, used to see him, and they were bloody good peanuts. Yeah, you know, the best. I, I never used to like peanuts, but once I tasted his peanuts, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how did he do it? <laughs> well, Dave, it's been mm. great talking to you, brother. Well, nice talking to you, Peter. I'm sorry if there yeah. was a bit of a down point there, but uh, we have to go through the highs and lows, and that's part of the podcast. No worries. After this, I'll see you at a gig somewhere. I hope so, mate. Yeah. All right. No worries. Cheers.
tear apart your head when voodoo strikes You wish that you was dead when voodoo strikes It'll tear apart your head when voodoo strikes